Good evening, everybody, and welcome to St. Mary's County Library's author talk with Angie Kim. Angie Kim is the author of two very highly acclaimed novels, Miracle Creek and Happiness Falls, which came out this year or this past year, August, <laughs> um, and has won many awards as well. So her debut novel, Miracle Creek, won many, many awards, um, and this one also won many awards. If you've read her novels, you know that they focus on a mystery of some sort and a Korean-American family that has immigrated over, um, and they always have children, and um, they also have a disease that you might not have heard of um, that is the center figure and very important to the stories. Um, a little bit about Angie Kim. She moved here from Seoul, South Korea to the suburbs of Baltimore. After graduating from the Interlock Arts Academy, she studied philosophy at Stanford. She attended Harvard Law and she was the editor of the Harvard Law Review. Her debut novel, Miracle Creek, like I said, won many awards, one of which was the Edgar Award, the most prestigious of American Mystery Writers Awards, and the ITW Thriller Award, and the Strands Critics Award, and the Pinkley Prize. It won many other awards as well. She was named one, it was named one of the best books of the year by Time, Washington Post, Kirkus Review. And now Happiness Falls has also won many awards as well. Um, what really caught my attention was that it was Good Morning America book club book. I was like, yay, she's a book club yeah. book. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah, okay. So we're going to talk this time because she came and visited us before when um, Miracle Creek came out. So this time the discussion will focus on the different aspects of Happiness Falls. Yeah. Welcome, Angie. Welcome. Yay. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And hi, everyone. Um, and Kimberly, since um, when um, when you are reading my bio, I, I admitted some people who are in the waiting room since I was like a co-host. Oh, thank you. Thank um, you. Yeah. I, there are so many people coming in. There's so many people coming in. at one Yeah. Time. So yeah. thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you to the librarians and to the library itself. Um, I love libraries. I think I talked about this last time, but when I first um, came over as an immigrant, um, House and Library in the Baltimore area was my home library. And I sort of went there to hide out from all the people who were kind of like bullying me all, you know, I, I came over in middle school. So that was a hard time anyway. And um and it's actually because of the librarians that I figured out like what uh, boarding schools I could apply to to pursue the arts. And um, they helped me to do that without my parents even knowing anything about it. I don't think they knew that I was doing this without the, their permission. But anyway, so I'm very, very grateful to libraries and I love doing library events. So thank you so much for, for having me. And, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions or you know, um, uh, and I'm happy to like start off by talking a little bit about Happiness Falls and why I came to write Happiness Falls. Um, whatever you guys would like. What should I do, Kimberly? Okay. So um, my thing is, I have a lot of questions about Happiness Falls. Okay. But great. first, I will ask the general ones. Um, were you writing this book as soon as you finished Miracle Creek? Or did you wait a while? Or when did so you start? Yeah. So, I mean, so I feel like all the stories um, and books um, that I write have a very long incubation period. So I'm thinking about them. I'm doing a lot of free writing. Um, I am sort of trying out different scenes in my mind. Um, I'm trying out different voices, all of that sort of stuff, even why, even before I start writing, writing, like even before I start writing from like chapter one and trying to really think of like, what should chapter one be? Um, and, um, and I think the other thing is that, um, is interesting is that after, you know, Miracle Creek came out, because it was my debut novel, I didn't really know what to expect. I was on tour. 
and I was doing so many events and I was just sort of like in this world where I was going to book festivals for the first time and meeting a lot of like author friends and all of that sort of stuff. So because of that, I think that I probably took a lot longer to get kind of acclimated to that world. So I, there was a lot of time when I was not really writing and I was also writing like a lot of essays and, you know, things that had to do with um, the publicity for Miracle Creek rather than like, you know, being able to focus on the next project. And so during that time when I was traveling and stuff, I was actually thinking a lot about Happiness Falls, uh, but I wasn't like writing anything down. I was just sort of like thinking about it in my head. And then when people would ask me like, what are you working on? What do you think your next book is? I would sort of talk about this concept that I had in my mind of this family that is a biracial family, you know, Korean American um, with three kids, one of whom is a non-speaker. And what would happen if, you know, something really urgent and sort of emergency like happened that only the non-speaker knew about that, like brings that issue of the non-speaking and how to communicate with the non-speaker in the family and how that affects the family dynamic um, and bringing that issue to the front and center. So I, I was kind of like thinking about that, but not, but I didn't actually start writing like the first line, which is uh, we didn't call the police right away. That didn't come until June of 2020, which is when the story is set. And that is when I was like, okay, that I know as soon as that came, which I think came the first day that I set, sort of told myself, okay, I'm going to like write this, um, that I knew that that was going to be the first line and that never changed. And then I sort of like tend to write in order in which you see the book. Um, so, so I definitely sort of started and that was, that was sort of the starting line. Okay. So, um, that's how you started it. So do you, when you write, you plot your outline first and then you go from there or is it just? I do not. Yeah, I don't plot. Um, I mean, I like to, I, I would like to plot. It's not that I don't try to plot. <laughs> it's just when I try to do that, I find that um, it just, it it's kind of like comes in a vacuum. So like thinking about like what should happen next without having written the scene of what's happening now seems really like too um too conceptual to me so it's not something that I feel like I can do and so I end up um thinking in broad terms about sort of like um what I want to happen but like I can I can't really see beyond sort of the scene that I'm in Mm -hmm. And so it's almost like some people have made this um, analogy. Some people have said writing is kind of like driving at night while there's a rainstorm. You just need to be able to focus on like what you can see right in front of you and focus on just driving well and not veering off the road like in front of you. And as long as you do that and keep on following the road, then you will eventually get there. So it's kind of like that for me. Um, the analogy that I have like come up with that works for me and my writing process, mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of like I am starting on the East Coast, which is where I am, and sort of saying, you know what, I'm going to drive to the West Coast. I'm not sure if I'm going to end up in San Diego or like, you know, Portland or, you know, wherever it is, but somewhere on the West Coast. And I turn off my phone and I turn and I don't have a map in front of me. So I'm not like really trying to follow anything in particular. I maybe have an idea of like what I might like to try to do in the next like hour or two, you know, mm -hmm. and so I start driving I might see signs like maybe I'll see a sign for, you know, national park with waterfalls. And I'm like, huh, yeah, I'm kind of in the mood for that. Let's go check that out. And I let it kind of like take, take me wherever it is. And if I find myself going through a little town and it seems cute, then maybe I'll stop there and maybe I'll like spend a couple of days there. Who knows that kind of thing. And then what every like one to two weeks or so I'll sort of like, turn on my phone and see where I am and see where I've been. And I'll kind of like jot that down. 
And I'll also see like where, how much farther I have to go. And I may say to myself, wow, I've really gone north and I have not gone west at all. So I, I should really try to, you know, go get, go down a little more south and west um, the next couple of days, that kind of thing. And so it's kind of like that in that I write and I write whatever seems good to me and I very rarely have an idea of exactly what I want to write after the scene that I'm in. And then once I'm done with the scene and I'm happy with it, then I will open up like a little outline document and I will write down like where I am in the story. So I'm basically making an outline as I'm writing. Okay. And yeah. And then once I'm done, like, and I'm on the West Coast, then I can look back and sort of do the revision process where I like look at where I've been and go like, hmm, that waterfall d- didn't turn out to be so great. So I think we should skip that next time. Or maybe I should spend more time in this little town that, you know, I kind of bypassed, but now I'm like thinking about it more. I think that I need more of that you know that kind of thing so so that's kind of my writing process okay um for those who are new to you um how did you transition from being a lawyer and into your creative writing phase yeah so I um being a lawyer is something that I did in my 20s and it was the first thing that I did I actually think that I became a lawyer as um, kind of a backup plan to what I really wanted to do. So what I really wanted to do as a teenager was, and what I went to high school for is I um, was in theater. And so I wanted to be an actor and this was in the eighties. And I was told by my acting coaches in high school that, Hey, you know what? Um, You are Asian. And if you didn't know, and there are no roles for Asians. And so you really like, we worry that if you went into acting professionally, that you would not be able to like survive and, you know, like have a fulfilling life. So instead of that, why don't you, we hear that you're good at academics. So why don't you go do that? Whatever that is. And so I was like, what could I do in academics that I'm excited about? And then I sort of thought of those lawyers on TV, you know, like kind of telling their stories and saying objection and being all dramatic. And I was like, you know what, that kind of seems like being on stage, like that performative element. So I really, so that's like, seriously, why I I think I, you know, was pre-law and I did philosophy in college. And, um, and then I ended up, going to, you know, and then I ended up going to uh, law school and I was a litigator and I did love being in the courtroom. That was like my favorite part. Um, Unfortunately, only like 5% of my, you know, day-to-day life as a lawyer actually involved being in the courtroom and I hated everything else about being a lawyer. So I immediately quit like after, I don't know, like four years or something of being a lawyer. I um, went into business, I was a management consultant, and then I was a dot-com entrepreneur. And then um, I became a stay-at-home mom after my first child was born right as we were selling our company. And so I, and then I have three boys and all three are fine now, but one, uh, all three of them had medical issues as babies and toddlers. And so during that time, I wanted to go back to work, but like, I just couldn't because there was just so much to do. There were so many hospitals to take them to and specialists to see and research to do and insurance filings, you know, denials to fight and all of that sort of stuff. And at some point I decided, you know what, I need catharsis. Um, There was one day when I found myself in the aisle of my local Whole Foods where I was trying desperately to look for something that I could buy in the store that would not kill one of my kids. All three of my kids had like weird 
digestive, you know, allergy, those kinds of issues when a celiac, you know, this was back when before they had gluten free aisles in any of the supermarkets. And I was like crying in the middle of the aisle. And I, a friend of mine whom I hadn't seen in a long time came up to me, recognized me and gave me a hug and was like, what is going on? And I kind of unloaded to her. And that night I sort of thought, wow, I feel so much better having told someone my story of what I've been going through and so I started writing that night instead of like doing all the cooking that I and preparing and cleaning that I should have been doing for the next day I started writing and that was sort of the beginning and I started with personal essays and my husband sort of the practical lawyer was like I love these things that you're writing but these stories are not just your stories. There are family stories and there are children's stories. A lot of them have like medical privacy issues and, you know, insurability and all that. So he was like, so why not try fiction? And I was like, fiction? I don't know how to write fiction. So I started taking classes at the Writer Center in Bethesda. And, um, and I also took classes at the Gotham Writing um, Center, which is an online thing, writingclasses.com that still exists. Um, I love their classes. And I started with short fiction. And once I started writing fiction, I was like, this is what I've been waiting for, like what I've been searching for all my life. Like I've been going from career to career, job to job, like looking for something that fulfills me on a day to day basis. And that makes me like fulfilled on, you know, like a more macro level. And this was it. And so I just kind of became hooked. You are seeing my writing closet, a tiny little closet that I like carved away from myself so that I could hide away from my kids that has very bad Wi Fi, um, you know, all of that sort of stuff. And, um, and so like this became my place to go, you know, and just sort of write and indulge myself. And I, and I started doing that in my forties. So that's also like an, you know, hopefully a note of inspiration for people that you can get started at any age. So. Okay. We have a question. I know writers don't talk too much about this, but do you have an idea for your next novel um, is there a few ideas percolating? Yeah. So I always, I have so many ideas, like ideas are not the problem for me. Um, I have so many ideas. So the problem, so the problem for me, especially like for this one, like happiness falls, I had many different ideas to choose from. And it's, and I, I talked about, you know, how I have that period of incubation where I am just sort of like thinking about different ideas and at some point and doing a lot of free writing and at some point like one of the story ideas will kind of emerge as like yeah this is the one that I want to do so I do have an idea like that for my next book I've started doing free writing and things like that it's going to be dystopian and it's going to be I think linked stories um, and it's very high concept. And because it's so high concept, I am keeping it kind of like close to my vest and not telling anybody about it because I'm really excited about it. And I think it's it's a really cool idea. And I'm very, very excited about it. So I am. And uh, it was like one of these ideas that I told my agent about it. And she was like, why has nobody written about this before? And I was like, right, I know. And so when when you I think when you have an idea like that, then, you know, you kind of like I get I, I'm a little I, I for for Happiness Falls, I told everybody what the idea was. And I was like, this is what I'm writing. And for this next one, I think it's going to be the opposite. I think I'm just going to like write it and kind of keep it close to me until it's done. And, you know, and then I send it off to my agent. Um, yeah, so, but I do think that it's going to be different in structure from Miracle Creek and Happiness Falls. Um, Miracle Creek was, I, I, you know, because I didn't start writing until my 40s, um, I am because I don't have an MFA or an undergrad, like creative writing, you know, degree and things like that. I'm really like thinking of the actual writing process as my own writing education, as my own sort of homemade MFA. And so um, I am trying to do, you know, different things with each book. So for Miracle Creek, I had seven 
um, POV or point of view characters that I went back and forth. Um, each chapter was a different character. They were all in close third. And uh, with Happiness Falls, you know, I kind of like did the opposite. I took one narrator um, in but first. Unreliable person. narrator kind yeah. of too. Yeah, well, I mean, she is being very truthful in her way. Sometimes mm. a little too truthful yeah. and a little too much information. And I think because she's trying to be truthful to us, but you know, as she acknowledges, she has, she's so filled with regret over her yes. own actions and inactions that she, sometimes that gets in the way, obviously, you know, yeah. she's a little bit myopic as she, even though she thinks she knows everything, she really does not. <laughs> and which I think she comes to realize by the end. So, so there's that. So this is one person and, you know, first person, very voicey all the way through. And then for my next book, I really want to do linked stories um, where, you know, each chapter is a different character is, you know, they're telling their own story, but like one ma main character from one chapter will kind of be a minor ca ca um, character in the next one and things like that. So, yeah. Okay. Um, several people in my book club and um, a guest here, like the audiobook and they're oh. curious do you have any say in who gets to be your reader in the audiobooks yes. and did you <laughs> like how they portrayed your people yes definitely so I, I I don't know if every author does this or if it's just me because I um, like the standard contract that I got to review um, for both my my first book which is uh, FSG Macmillan and Happiness Falls, which is Hogarth slash Random House, which is part of Penguin uh, Random House. Both of those contracts did not say anything about the audiobook. And I specifically asked my agent, I mean, because of my acting background, it's really important to me. And when I read audio, when I listen to audiobooks, the, the narrator's performance, I find it so affects whether I enjoy a book or not. And so I specifically asked my agent to please put in a clause into the contract saying that I have, you know, right of um, meaningful consultation or something like that. And so they did send me for both of them. They sent me all of the aud aud um, audition tapes and let me listen to them and let me say, yeah, that's not really working for me. Let me give oh, that's notes great. Yeah. or like, can you go back out and find some other people? Um, and then for Happiness Falls, I love the audiobook so much. So it's um, so I, I absolutely love the main person who did, you know, Mia's voice. Mm -hmm. But I also um, love that we got a different narrator to sort of narrate the father's, the missing father's um, happiness notebooks and oh, trees. Yeah. So nice. that was fun. And then this is really special to me. The most special thing was that at the end, uh, not at the end, but like towards the end, we get to hear Eugene, the non-speaker's thoughts. And for that one, um, I really wanted to have a narrator who is more authentic. But of course, like that was kind of a problem in the sense that you know, like they're non-speakers. So how, so if you get a non-speaker, how do you do that? So I was talking about this with uh, my, I have students, I teach creative writing, I volunteer and I teach creative writing to um, non-speakers, most of whom are autistic in this area. Well, actually I do some virtual. So some those, the virtual students are kind of all over the US and Canada. But the um, ones, the main group that is in person is in Herndon, Herndon, Virginia. Any case, I was talking to them about this. And one of them said, well, I have a friend, Autastic Tom. And Autastic Tom um, has, um, he has this YouTube channel and he's a speller. So he communicates um, like Eugene does in the book by spelling, like by pointing to letters individually. And, um, and I was like, so confused. I was like, Oh, how does that work? So he has this video. I'm going to see if I can put it into um, here we go. I found it. I'm going to put the link to it. 
in the oh sorry okay so i'm putting it into the zoom chat um to everyone right now but anyway so so he so autistic Tom, this is like a link to a three minute video that sort of explains that there are three different types of non speakers. There are people who are like can't talk at all. And then there are people who are minimal speakers, they can just say a few things. And then he says, like, there are people like me who talk all the time. But I'm an unreliable speaker. So when I have a thought that I want to express and I open my mouth to express it, something else entirely comes out and I can't control what words come out of my mouth. And so um, like the first time I met him, he was like, you know, I would say, Hey Tom, how are you? And he would be like, Hey Tom, how are you? Hey Tom, how are you being echolalic? And then also like scripting, like, you know, um, some ad that he, you know, had just seen for Pringles or whatever while he was like, say um using his fingers to actually um communicate like hi how are you i'm so excited for this opportunity things like that so anyway so he says one of the ways that i can actually use my voice to communicate my thoughts is to first spell and then have my um you know my uh, communication partner like write it out for me uh, write out what i spelled and then hold it in front of me. And when I focus on the words that are held in front of me, then I can go ahead and read out loud. And so I was like, well, he could do that with Eugene's words. So we had him audition. His mom told me that he's 25. He has wanted to be a performer his entire life. And so he was so excited. And then so when my audiobook producer at PRH heard this, like, you know, this story, she was like, I think we found our Eugene. And so he was able to come and record. So I'm so excited. Like, I feel like it made the audiobook so, you know, special to me. So I'm, I, I love hearing that people love the audiobook. Okay. Um, Nancy would like to know, do you have a large family that you interact with? She thinks your skills of developing characters make the narrative so personal to the readers. Oh, I love that. Thank you. So I am an only child and my husband is an only child. And I think we both are like, we hated being only children. <laughs> I was so lonely. I like I really am so jealous of my cousins um, who I have these cousins who are twins. And so I think that's one of the reasons why I'm like fascinated by twins. And I wanted to have characters who are twins. I've always been really intrigued by that kind of close sibling, you know, kind of relationship. Yeah. Yeah. So, so my husband and I were like, we were like, we're going to have five kids. And then we got to three. And then we were like, you know what? Maybe we should stop right now <laughs> because it's like a lot of work. And so we did stop after three kids, three boys. <laughs> but I love watching their interactions and sort of being with them and all that kind of stuff. So thank you so much for saying that. Um, my middle son, who's 20 now and in college, actually said the first time he read like the first 25 pages or so of this draft. He was like, I think you you stole my voice for Mia. So it's interesting that he thought that. Oh, that's yeah. that is interesting. Mia yeah. was a very interesting character. Yeah. Um, yeah. Since we're talking about your characters, which ones um, did you feel the connection with the most in this book? Which character did I connect with the most? Mm -hmm. I mean, probably probably Mia. Um, I mean, in many ways, she is me. I mean, hopefully, I'm not as bratty as she is now. Um, but I probably was when I was 20, you know, um, there are a lot of her the elements of her that go on in my mind, I, I do tend to be an overanalyzer and overthinker. Like, seriously, my friends will oftentimes, and my husband will oftentimes be like, you are overthinking this, just stop talking about it and just make a decision and go forward. And I do the same thing with, you know, writing too, where I will overthink, you know, the cadence of one, you know, sentence or whatever for three days until I just drive myself crazy. So there is definitely that element of like over analyzing and all of that sort of stuff. Um, 
and of course Mia is being confessional to us and and Mia is writing something like that you know she doesn't mean to share with the world certainly you know this is like a confession that she is making for sort of really her family and you know for her father especially and so I do think that she's being very vulnerable and very honest and she's saying a lot of things that she would never reveal to, you know, like anybody else. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so I think that if, so, so I, I, I really like that element of what she's doing. And even when she is being bratty and like frustrating, I do find it endearing that she's kind of like willing to share that side with us. Mm-hmm. So I think I, I like that element of her. Of course, the mom who's a Korean immigrant and who has majored in philosophy and who is like obsessed with Star Trek. I definitely, uh, um, you know, identify with her because, you know, I, I share all of those, those things with her too. So, and also like the father, his obsession with happiness, I definitely Um, have been obsessed with happiness concepts my entire life and the whole idea of relativity of happiness and trying to figure out how to sort of like figure out the baseline for you know and lower your baseline so that you can be try to be happier that way that's something that I've thought a lot about um, both for myself and for my kids so um, all of those things I think I, I think in some ways there are elements of each character that I really like that resonate with me and then that are from me. And then there are elements of all the characters that I just find kind of, you know, despicable or alien or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. Um, So the happiness thing, when did you first start thinking that you could quantify or measure happiness? When did you first start studying that? Yeah. So I, the quantification part didn't come until after I think I wrote Miracle Creek. So in Miracle Creek, I had a couple of things in there about uh, the relativity of happiness and about how like some of the characters are sort of comparing their own happiness levels to um, char- the happiness levels of other characters who are kind of like worse off than they are objectively speaking Mm -hmm. and yet like have moments when they seem really happy. And so they're kind of like mystified by that. And I was too. And so I started thinking about that and I started thinking like, okay, how, how, what's a, what's a good way to think about this. And so because of my management consulting background, I think um, I'm very into having spreadsheets for like everything. And so whenever I I do really anything, whenever I have any kind of decision to make, I tend to make a spreadsheet and try to put it into numbers because something Mm -hmm. about that, like something about simplifying it to that level sometimes helps me to, Mm -hmm. you know, like be able to compare different things. And so I decided to do that for happiness and sort of like um, thinking about different scenarios that people might be involved in. And I do think that my obsession with happiness did come from, you know, being an immigrant. Um, I came over as an immigrant from Seoul to Baltimore when I was 11. And in Korea, we were so poor. Um, and we had like no running water. We, um, you know, barely, we, I, we did not have electricity, like all of these things that we took for granted here, um, we did not have. And so um, when we found out that we were getting a visa to come to the US, everybody was like, oh my God, it's like you won the lottery. And then when we came over here, you know, I lived with my aunt, um, my, my parents had to, they were running like a grocery store that was in a very, very dangerous part of town with thick bulletproof glass, all that kind of stuff in downtown Baltimore. And they did not want me to come visit because it was too dangerous. And, um, and they, their hours were so long that they were sleeping in the back. So I basically never saw them. And I was now living with my aunt with whom I loved, but still I didn't know her. Right. She's Mm -hmm. like a stranger to me. 
And she lived in this beautiful house, like in the suburb, you know, in the suburbs, I had my own bedroom for the first time, we had running water, we had toilets, you know, like, what which is shock. so much, which is so much better than an outhouse for sure. So I was happy about that. And showers and, you know, color TVs and refrigerators and all these things. And yet I was just so miserable, you know, mm. like losing my family, losing that relationship with my parents and also losing my language, you know, and not being able to speak. Um, and so, so I think like I started thinking a lot about sort of objective happiness versus subjective happiness and what makes one like, like, why was it that I was supposed to be happy? Everybody was saying that I was happy and yet I felt so miserable. So that kind of like started my lifelong, you know, obsession with happiness. And, um, and then when I like heard in college about sort of the lottery winner study that says, and this is in the book, but you know, there's a study that says that there are a bunch of lottery winners. And then there's a group of paraplegics who've been in, um, you know, uh, accidents and they lose their limbs. And then like a year after the, the event, the lottery winning or the accident, you measure their happiness levels, you, you know, do like studies. And it turns out that there isn't like really a meaningful difference in happiness, but among these two groups, which is so counterintuitive. But when I heard that, I was like, that reminds me of when I went through something similar in, you know, Korea, like in Korea, my baseline was like set. And I didn't know that what I had was like, not good. And so I was happy relative to what, I, you know, my own expectations. Um, and so I started thinking a lot about expectations and baseline and happiness levels relative to that. And that started me on my whole thing of like trying to quantify it, finding examples that were really clear and trying to figure out, is there a way that I can like come up with a formula to help myself and my characters be happier? Oh, okay. Yeah. So I was, you know, I get the, I get the idea of, of happiness falls, but I was just wondering why you didn't call it like happiness quotient. So it, I, I wanted to call it happiness quotient. I sold it as happiness quotient. Oh, okay. Then, yeah. So it was supposed to be happiness quotient. And then my editors and my marketing people were like, so happiness quotient, quotient is kind of like a hard word. Um, it seems like it's my UK editor was like, people don't really know what it means. You know, it's one of these things that, you know, when you're like in fourth grade, but then you kind of forget <laughs> what it means over time, uh -huh. you know, kind of like the pie, you know, Okay. and um, and so, yeah. So and then they also worried that it made it sound like a nonfiction book. Oh, I can see that. Yeah. yeah so it was like all of those things. And also, like when I sold the book, um, I'm reaching over to show you something. So what I sold this book when it was back in December 2020, when it was 60 pages long, based on the first 60 pages, plus, um, you know, like a two page um, pitch letter. And most of that pitch was like this Venn diagram. And huh. so... So there are three circles. There's a missing, you know, there's the missing father mystery arc. There's um, the ha HQ, the happiness quotient. And then there's the um, voice fluency arc, um, the non-speaking. And then where they meet in the middle is sort of like the ending. Okay. And, um, and so my editor like so I've been keeping this next to me as I was writing and I was like you know this is sort of my goal for the book is to sort of have these three strands all like interweaving and then come together for the ending and I didn't know what the ending was of course I know what happened to the father so my editor is like so what happened to the father and I was like I have no idea let's hope that we find out in like two and a half years or so um and so his whole I, like thing was there are three circles and only one of them is the happiness quotient. So let's find a title that encompasses all three of those circles rather than only one of them. 
Um, so which I thought was like, that was to me was the most interesting idea. And, and we went around, we had so many title ideas. We were really upset with each other for like a good month there where we were like, I would come up with something and they would be like, no. And then they would come up with something and I'd be like, no. And we were just all mad at each other. And, um, and then, and then my UK editor came up with happiness falls and we were like, I think that seems right. Yeah, that works because of the whole, we just assume that's what happened. Well, I mean, so there's like waterfalls yeah. uh, in chapter one. There's, you know, um, on the first like 10 pages, there's a big uh, Eugene, the non-speaker pushes Mia, you right. know, and she has a big fall that causes her, you know, ankle break. The, and, and also happiness falls and rises like right. it ebbs and yep. flows. It's mm-hmm. like that. So many different things. Yeah. yeah, it could stand for a lot yeah. of things. But I was just wondering because HQ was in there so much. I was like, well, why wasn't that the name? I okay. know. Well, but that I does make so sense because that does sound yeah. more like a nonfiction book than a um yeah than a fiction one. Yeah. So your new novel um, that you're working on right now is that going to have a Korean American family? Or... I'm sure it will. I'm okay. positive it will, and I'm I'm also sure that. Um, I, I, I think that it's going to have elements from different things that I've written. So I think that I'm hoping that there will be something that is, you know, like from the, like a character from Miracle Creek. Um, uh, I'm hoping that there will be like a character that will revisit from Happiness Falls and, you know, that they make appearances. Um, there are some characters in happiness falls like shannon is the lawyer is Mm -hmm. a character who was in miracle creek and some of the important characters from miracle creek make like tiny little cameos in the middle of happiness falls Um, yeah i do like having elements of that i just think it's really fun it's just a little you know like a little wink nod to the readers that are um that have read both and that are kind of like paying attention so i love that um how Lisa said that the happiness falls feels like the pandemic is another character in the book. And since you did start it in 2020, um, how much did your own pandemic experience influence the story? Yeah, I mean, completely. I, I think I didn't initially think that the pandemic was going to be a setting here. But when I started writing, I had so much trouble writing. Um and, you know, it was such a weird time. And to be writing about something that didn't have the pandemic in it, it was almost like I forgot what it was like to, you know, like, like kind of be a family outside that time. And so it wasn't until I sort of said, okay, I just as a writing exercise, I'm going to go ahead and write as if it's happening now in June of 2020. And I can always write that out, but I need to like actually just like get going. And I found that when I put it into the pandemic era, it just kind of freed something up for me and it allowed me to actually write. Um, And, and then, and I think like part of, part of that experience was that a lot of like what I am feeling and going through, I was able to express through my writing And so um, later we thought about taking it out, but there were like so many things that thematically I thought worked with the pandemic setting. Mm -hmm. So like, for example, the masks that we, that some of the characters wear um, and it hides like um, Eugene who has Angelman syndrome, Mm -hmm. which is characterized by kind of like constant smiling the smile kind of acts as a mask for Eugene for his own emotions. So like the whole like idea of wearing a mask that covers up the smile mask, that kind of like resonated with some people, um, with some of my beta readers. And also like the idea that, you know, during a pandemic, your, your baseline changes so drastically, our entire society's baseline changed so so drastically. Mm -hmm. So all of those kinds of things too. Yeah. Okay. We are getting towards the end. Um, So we always like to ask for recommendations and Chris wants to know what you are looking forward to. What books in 2024 do you have any that you're looking forward to? Yeah. So in 2024, um, you know, because we, um, I'm now reading books that are going to be coming out in 2025. 
So I'm like looking around to see if there's... Oh, authors send you books now, huh? Yeah, yeah, I mean, so... So you can do I, the little blurb? Yes. So I, yeah, for, I think for the last three years or so, I'd say I get a good, I don't know, like two to three books per week uh -huh. from publishers, from authors. Yes. Yeah, so I have so many books. In fact, I had to do a huge like donation to a library or something, you know, uh -huh. because, um, because I had so many books that were just like in huge piles in my dining room. Like you couldn't even get to the table. Oh, so you can and tell so us I about just, books that haven't so, come out. Yes. Yeah, so I just did that. Like last, um, I, I just did that, um, like last week. So anyway, but I'm trying to think what is coming out in 2024 that I'm excited about. There's a great book. I, and I don't have any of these with me so that I can show you. Um, but there's a great book called Bear by Julia Phillips that um, she is a really, really, really good friend of mine. Her first book, Disappearing Earth, came out in 2019. And so that's a wonderful book that um, I'm excited about. Come and Get It just came out today, I believe, uh, by Kylie Reed. Um and I, I loved that book. I love the voice and everything in that book. I loved her first book as well. Um, what else is coming out in 2024 that I'm really excited about? Uh, oh, I know. Um, Teo Obrecht is uh, publishing. I, I'm actually in the middle of reading that right now. So that is not one for blurbing. But um, let's see. What is that called? So Teo Brecht, who did, um, it's called The Morning Side. She, she's the one who wrote The Tiger's Wife, which is oh, okay. yeah. one of my favorite, favorite books. Um, so she has a book called The Morning Side mm -hmm. that is coming out that I really am so excited about. Um, it is, it's kind of dystopian too. Um, it's Ooh, like, like oh, yeah, like it's like, yeah, I like it's it, yeah, it is dystopian and um so it's and it's also like a mother-daughter story with a dystopian twist, so I really like that as well. Um yeah, so those are some of the ones that I'm really excited about. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh one more question. Um what was the process of getting published? And you switched publishers too. You I see. did. Yeah. 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 So the pu process of getting published, I mean, for me, um, so for me, the, the process of getting published for my debut novel is probably like the most interesting because I think it's like, it's, you need to get an agent, you know, for really anybody for novels. Um, uh, I think you know, don't, necessarily need an agent if you're writing like middle grade you know fiction or grade grade um school fiction but otherwise definitely you you need an um an agent and the way that um and the way that i uh got an agent that's this is kind of an interesting story is so you know because i didn't have an mfa and so i didn't know anybody or anything like that um, what you have to do is you first have to write the whole book. And this is especially wow. for fiction. In nonfiction, you can do a proposal and some sample chapters. But for fiction, you have to write the first, the whole book first for your first book. Okay. And so you have to do that. And um, and you have to make it like as good as it can possibly get. So like, you know, have it edited and, you know, show it to other people and whatever. And once I was like basically done with that process and I felt like I wanted to like, you know, um, get an agent, I looked up like, and I Googled like top 10 agents in New York, you know, <laughs> that type of thing. But I also like looked up some of my favorite books that I thought were comparable to Miracle Creek in terms of tone, voice, mm -hmm. genre, all of that sort of stuff. And at the end of the each book, when the acknowledgments, all the, um, all the authors always, you know, thank their agents. 
And so you can figure out who somebody's agent is. Oh, so that's smart. I, yeah. So by doing that, I was able to like have a spreadsheet of some of my favorite authors that I admire that I wanted to emulate and, you know, my role models and their agents. Another good um, uh, way to look at this, which I did as well, is it's called Publishers Marketplace. And it does cost money, but it's only monthly. So you can only, you know, you can just like pay for a month and then you can, or you can go through a library, I think. Um, and the publisher's marketplace is um, they list all of the authors and agents. And so they will tell you for each author who their current agent is. And you can also look up all of the deals, all the deal announcements. So um, by doing that, I was able to get, and also by Googling, like, who are the hot agents right now? I was able to get, you know, a good list of like my top 10 dream agents. And so once I had that, I basically sent queries, which are all emails now, you know, or online mm -hmm. you know, forms. And you have to follow each, each person has their own, like, rules of like what you can send them um you know some say send me the whole manuscript i don't think anybody actually says that some say send don't even send me anything of the manuscript on just send me like a one page letter a query letter and if i like the sound of it then i'll ask you for the full manuscript and then some people will say like send me the first 10 pages some will say send me the first three chapters whatever and so i followed all of the rules and i and then i one of them one of the 10 did get back to me wanted the full manuscript and i was able to get an offer from one of them and once i got an offer from one i immediately sent an offer uh, a, an email back to the other nine saying like offer of representation you know are you still interested if so I have an offer of representation and I'd love to know if you are interested and because of the fear of missing out FOMO like I got eight <laughs> out of the nine Wow. that <laughs> night responded saying that night, I wanna read wow. it. That night. yeah wow. and um and so that is a really, I think, good thing to to try to do um, if you can. And um, anyway, if you if you happen to get one, you know, response, then that's you can like my of theory that. of when people are having yard sales. I tell them all the time, if you're having a yard sale, park your cars in front of your yard and people will stop because they'll think, oh, oh look at all these other people here. Exactly. And exactly. Yeah. Right? I tell people yeah, that all exactly. the time. I it's totally people. FOMO. It's mm -hmm. always, you know. Yeah. And so, so yeah, so I was able to get like a couple of different offers, like, you know, like five or something. And then mm -hmm. I went up to, and then I went up to New York and I met with them and to see like, how do we feel? Like, because your agent is so important. Your agent mm -hmm. is the most important person who can, you know, they, cause they're the ones who develop relationships with editors. They know what editors like, what kinds of books. So okay. like my agent was able to say, I bet these editors are going to be interested in the voice of your novel and the concept and the, you know, all of that sort of stuff, the genre, all of that. And so, you know, and then, so she and I worked together for a little bit for like a couple months to develop, you know, to edit further and do another revision, revision or two. And then we, and then she sent it out and then she held an auction and then we, you know, and then based on the offers that we got through that, we chose an editor. And then the editor that I, I went with, um, Sarah Crichton at FSG, uh, which is far Strauss and Giroux, she unfortunately left before my book was came out. So that happens a lot. Really? Um, yeah, uh, it's called getting orphaned and authors are orphaned a lot. So oh, she, no. we had at least finished editing and all that. And, you know, and we, I already had the team in place and all that kind of stuff. So a lot of her job as an editor was kind of done, but still like it was really hard to lose her. And that's one of the reasons why I decided that I felt comfortable moving to a different editor in a different, you know, um, publisher, even though I loved FSG and all that, it's just that, you know, like I wanted to be with an editor who chose me 
you know, mm-hmm. who really, who, who didn't just inherit me from some somebody else. Right. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Um, any other last questions before we close out? Yeah. Does anybody have anything else? Um, I do. Um, I know you have a lot of speaking engagements and things. Where's your next speaking engagement? Where can we see you next? Oh, okay, great. Yeah, so um, one thing, so I am doing a paperback tour later this year. Ooh, paperback so we're, tour. Okay. Yeah, so we are um, putting that together. So my, my team, my publicity team is putting that together mm-hmm. right now. This weekend, I'm actually leaving tomorrow to go to Palm Springs. So the Palm Springs Book Festival. Oh, this nice. Weekend. So that's going to be really, really fun. At the end of February, I am doing an all community read in outside Chicago in Schaumburg. Mm-hmm. Um, the Schaumburg um, library system is sponsoring, you know, this thing. And so my speaking agent, um, I have a speaking agent and mm-hmm. they like they 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 have gotten me a lot of these really fun gigs which is like these communities like you know whether it be one town or uh you know a county or a, a high school or a college will and, and um did do your and- agent set you up with the publicity team too is that what they do no so my publicity team um like book tour and things like that that's uh-huh. actually done by your publisher so the penguin random house publisher kind of like pays for a publicist they have in-house publicists they're part of my team at hogarth and they are the ones that like talk to libraries and bookstores um and you know set up the these tours you know for when the book first comes out so those are the book tours and those are you know like yeah the the publisher pays for you know, all of the travel and all that kind of stuff. These ones that I'm going on a lot this year are the ones where I'm being invited to, you know, schools and colleges and communities and things like that to come. And so I'm doing that um, at the end of February for the Schaumburg Library outside of Chicago. So I'm really excited about that. And then I have a bunch of like fun things in... March, um, Tucson Festival of Books in Arizona, and um, lots of things. So I haven't actually done a really good job of keeping up with my website, but you're now actually like <laughs> reminding me. I'm going to I'm going to update my website. So my website, which is angiekimbooks.com, mm. uh, the events will have my events up there by tomorrow. <laughs> I'm I'm like making myself do it. <laughs> well that is great we look forward to seeing that and yeah. um if some people are on vacation and traveling to florida or if they can um if they record things and zoom in may- maybe they can see you there and that would be great dystopia is like i love all genres I-, I read just about every genre there is except for horror because i can't do it do that uh, um yeah. unless it's really light horror but i can't do the gore yeah but dystopia is like what it's like it's like after like romance and mystery like dystopia is my like yeah. I really so I'm excited about your dystopian one. Oh, good I'm very Thank excited you. about that yeah uh, it won't I be can't coming wait. for like it won't be coming for like five more years but still okay <laughs> all right so thank you so much for joining us today Angie we really thank appreciate you. it um we are always glad to have you and your books are <sighs> I, I really like how they're a mystery, but we learn something, their family dynamics, so many different. And then we learn about the Korean American immigrant experience. It's just so much packed into one book. Um, and now yeah. that I hear, I don't normally do fiction on audio because I get confused. Um, but now that I hear about the different voices that are in your book, I might re-listen to them now you on should. audio. Yes. Because you I've, have I've voice actors. Such- so yeah, I've heard I'm gonna have to re-listen to that. Yeah. yeah, and also the other thing is, if you, if for those of you in the audience, if you have your own book clubs that are, you know, reading this or anything like that, please um, feel free to reach out to me through my website, 
um, and let me know and maybe I can zoom in for like 30 minutes um, and answer some more questions, especially about the ending, which we didn't get to. And I'm sure some people. <laughs> well, because I didn't, I didn't get into with... too many details. Right. But there was a couple people who said they hadn't finished it yet. Definitely. So, no, I'm, I'm yeah. glad that we didn't for, you know, for an event like this, we shouldn't. But for book clubs, that's like one of the favorite things yes. book clubs yes. love to discuss is the ending. And because there's a little bit of an openness to it and it's open to <laughs> room for interpretation. There really so is. Talk, like, when so you get we to do the talk end, about it. Yeah. 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 It, for those who haven't gotten to the end, you will want to discuss. There yeah. will be discussions. I'm just so happy for you, Angie. Oh, thank your you. Books are, Cause I was a little concerned because your, your debut novel did so well. I was like, Oh, all that pressure. And then, but your second book did really well too. So yeah. Yay. yeah. Thank you. No, <laughs> hey. it's, yeah, it was definitely hard to write, but I'm glad I got through it. The, yeah. the second book. So now, you know, I can focus on this, on the third yeah. one. And so. I'm very happy that your sons are doing much better now as yes, well. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you so much everybody i thank hope you everybody you all. bye yeah.